So happy to have you here. Nice to be here. Yes, Royce Vavrek from Canada originally, but living in Brooklyn. <laughs> and you are also living in Brooklyn. But we, you, right. Mikael Carlson, the composer, you are from Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> and you have written this opera, Melancholia, that will have its premiere very, very soon. And we met, Mikael, when you were working here with Alexander Ekman, mm -hmm. uh, writing music to his different dance uh, performances. Yeah. Uh, but how, how did you meet Royce? How did you meet uh, Mikael? Yeah, we, we met basically like a decade ago uh, in New York City. Um, Mika was a participant in the American Opera Project's uh, Composers and the Voice program. Um, and I believe that I was maybe working at the Public Theater mm -hmm. in New York or shortly thereafter, and I went to see a presentation of his opera, Decoration, and his musical language really spoke to me. I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. And then you sent me a whole bunch of your music and I, I was just completely um, befuddled by how cool and, and just singular your, mm. your language was. Um, and so it took us a while to sort of figure out what we would do together. Um, and we've done a, a few smaller projects, but this yeah. is by far our, our biggest work together. Mm. Um, so, so, so what did you sort of like with, with Roy's way of well, writing? Well, first of all, Roy is someone who makes things happen. And uh, he's, I'm not that person <laughs> in the same way. He just, he's optimistic and he, he just makes strange things work out. And when I heard his uh, texts for other people's um, operas, uh, Dog Day especially, mm -hmm. and Breaking the Waves, it's just stunning. He has such a command of, a, of the language. And, Writing a libretto is an art form that I don't understand. I just feel when it's right, or when there's something there. But if I were to instruct someone that this is how you write it well, even though I'm the recipient of it, potentially, I couldn't. He just has it. And he's proven that over and over with yes. so many people. Very kind. <laughs> uh, and after uh, some discussions here in the house, uh, we, we decided that Melancholia, Lars von Trier's film, was going to be the, the theme or the base of this opera. Yeah. So what was it in this film or this story that you thought, oh, this is an opera? So, Royce, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lars von Trier is, uh, is such a huge figure in my life. I first saw his films when I was 14 years old. Um, and the first one I saw was Breaking the Waves. And it completely changed my life. Um, so much so that I, I turned it into an opera that premiered in 2016 and that has had quite a life and has gone all over the world. Um, so Von Trier as a storyteller has really informed so much of the way that I work, the kind of stories that I like to tell. Um, he's sort of, he's part of my DNA. Um, Melancholia is a, a piece that has massive ideas. It is a story writ very large. It has great moments of intimacy, but it is about the biggest event that mankind could ever face, uh, and that is a hurtling rock coming at our planet and imminent death. Um, and opera is often about sex and death, and in this piece, you get both mm. um, in, in many ways, in many configurations. Uh, and so I think that it, it announced itself as a piece that could uh, really uh, take Mika singular musical language and just explode it in the most gorgeous way. And I think, I think we've done that. Yeah. I yeah. hope we have. Uh, let's hope. <laughs> so did you get also sort of musical ideas when you thought about... Uh... Yeah, already the film has the Tristan music, right? Uh, so the film is kind of designed on an epic scale, even musically. But thankfully no one wrote a specific score for it, so we could just remove that and insert something else. But there's something about von Trier's ability to put something extremely beautiful inside something hurtful, perverse, or dangerous, or just impossible to process, that opens it up in a really wonderful way. Um, and I think that's a space that opera does well. That's a, that's a format that opera does well, where it's not a singular message or anything like that. It's just a feeling inside a movie. Um, it's, it's not, it, it can't be reduced to a message. It can't be reduced to that this is what the film is about. It's so wide and so open and the characters are so strange but wonderful. Um, and he, just, he allows them to be that without 
trying to reduce them to anything or to blame them or to, to put guilt in any direction. And I think that's a generous way of telling a story. And so we can step into that and let the audience have the same experience. We're not trying to tell them that this is how you feel here, or this is what this is about. We're just letting them inside this world to experience extremely dramatic events up close. This is not the film, though. I mean, no? you have made changes, uh, and there are, of course, natural changes. I mean, you have all this orchestra, you have a chorus, yeah. and you have to tell it in a not too long time, etc., <laughs> on stage. So, um, and of course, you have also to get the uh, an okay from Lars Trier <laughs> that okay, you can do this. So, d d what, what, what happened? Uh, have, have you changed? What have you changed? And also, did von Trier say that you can do this and you can't do that? Well, von Trier really, when we acquired the rights to the, the property, um, sort of gave us free reign um, and said uh, that uh, he'd already made his film, it's already there, and the public can see that, it's a document, it's a masterpiece in my opinion, and so it sort of gave us license to go and, and, and make those small changes. I would say that this is, is a piece that is remarkably faithful to the film, um, especially in an emotional way. Um, the characters um, have changed because they, they sing their feelings. <laughs> and uh, and we, I did have to really condense the script uh, because I think that the opera will end up being about as long as the film was. But music uh, expands words. And so you really, really have to reduce the, the, the word count so that it gives Mika the opportunity to, to fill um, the space. And, and the music tells so much of the story and, and sort of adds these emotional layers. Um, and so you have to trust that by um, condensing the words that Mika is going to fill them like fourfold or tenfold or a millionfold even. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know how many things we've changed. There have been sort of extrapolations on things. For instance, at the top of the film, there's this beautiful montage of images um, that includes the Bruegel painting, The Hunters in the Snow, um, this beautiful pre-Raphaelite painting of Ophelia, um, this image that I became obsessed with of a horse that is being pushed back by this invisible force um, and sort of like squished into the ground. And those became the bedrocks for certain scenes in Act Two. Um, but those were all little sort of clues um, that Lars von Trier put into his film that I thought that is something that seems very important to him. He included those. Mm -hmm. So opera can't really do montage very well, but opera can extrapolate and turn moments into these big surreal fantasias. And so um, really it was trusting Lars and the images that he put in his film um, and then taking them and jumping off and, and creating these like supremely operatic gestures. Yeah. And stepping into your world of music and sound, that's mm -hmm. very special, I think. I mean, you have a special sound world. Mm. And, and looking at the score and looking at all the instrumentation and all the, yeah, you have uh, sampled sounds. And yeah, yeah, you tell me, what, what is it in this score that makes this sound? <laughs> I mean, I, I start directly at instrumentation. And so it's, it's about falling in love with the sound. It's not about harmony, melody, and then we explode it onto the orchestra. So it starts with any sound that's attractive in any way. And I usually don't really know why. And so that's a way to start burrowing into a sound world. Um, I have a few things that I like, that I return to, but the first part of the process is about just gathering all these sounds and then see how they could kind of connect and become a thing so that this piece has its own sound world. And uh, my first focus is to make sure that there's enough to keep surprising people. And so that's why we have the, the synthesizers, we have sample synths, uh, which can basically be any sound. Um, we have percussion pads and uh, surround sound. All this is there to create a sound experience that isn't faithful to a tradition, but faithful to the spirit of what we're making instead. So, sure, we could be purist about opera and, you know, these beautiful voices I can project over an orchestra and the orchestra kind of dives under them. 
or we could just we could look at what is a huge experience for people today. It's going to be really truthful. It needs volume. It needs impact. It needs to be felt in the chest. It needs to be sounds that we know from what's actually contemporary, and not what was contemporary to composers in the 60s and 70s, like you know the 13th overtone on the violin. Great, but it doesn't read to a new audience as something that is brand new. So, we're try so the goal is to create something that's strange enough that I'm interested in it, and hopefully that then uh, makes other people interested in it. And so my, my task is not to become just weird, but to bring something new that makes sense. So to be rhetorical within this wide world of sounds that I like. Hmm. And it's, it's, I think it's great stepping into, into that world. I'm yeah. glad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say also, I have the great help of my orchestrator, uh, Michael P. Atkinson. Yeah. He, we orchestrate together after I'm done with the first draft, yeah. which is usually pretty shaky. Yeah. And, and we should perhaps say that the, there is uh, a, an ordinary opera orchestra there playing. Of course. And, yeah, and yeah. Of opera singers and opera <laughs> chorus and yeah. so on. So there are two... Uh, main characters, I would say, in this opera. The two sisters, Justine and Claire. Mm -hmm. What can we say about them? Yeah, um, they begin the opera um, on very different ends of the emotionally, um, or the emotional stability spectrum, we'll say. Um, and so it really is watching them as they sort of cross and intersect and end up on the, on the sort of the sides of the spectrum that they, the other one began the opera in. Yeah. Um, I would say that the story's beating heart is really that of Justine's character um, as we watch her descend uh, into a serious depression. And it seems like a, a relapse, like this is something that she has experienced before, um, but has not necessarily been experiencing these these pangs of depression. And for some reason on her wedding night, um, it, it sort of comes back with a vengeance. And that is, it co sort of coincides with a, a, an anomaly, a weird star that she sees in the sky that turns out uh, to be, um, to have this sort of dance with a planet that is about to come and strike Earth and, and kill all of humanity. Yeah. Uh, and so we basically watch her mental state as she deals with this impending doom and her sister as she's trying to care for her um, and at the same time come to terms with her own place in the universe and and dealing with this catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite a deep uh, psychological uh, story in a way. I mean, describing mm -hmm. these two very interesting and, and of course in a very, uh, what would you say, uh, extreme situation, of course, mm -hmm. very, very extreme. The most extreme, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's life and death, death, and that's mm -hmm. what opera, it works very well in opera, mm -hmm. I would say. I think it also touches on, so let, if you, we look at the history of opera, uh, you know, fear of God, murder, infidelity, class, all those things that used to be big subjects that really touched everyone, and those were the big fears. I'm not sure that they are anymore, uh, but this opera deals with pointlessness, loneliness, um, existential dread, <laughs> but also beauty mixed into that. And those are the real fears of today, I'm pretty sure. What if there's no point to anything? That, that's a terrifying question. Yeah. And I think that the film deals with that too in a beautiful way. And it doesn't give an answer, but it, it touches on the subject so that we can too. Mm -hmm. And it lets us come close to that. And I think it's weirdly um, soothing to have been there up to the fire and the flames. And to, to deal with an emotion that is, can only be expressed through an internal state. Mm. So we try to bring people to that. And I think von Trier did too. Mm. Uh, when we talked about this in, in the very, very beginning, and, and you hadn't written a, a note, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, of course the, the question that, that came up was, you know, melancholia, how, how is this planet going to sound? That, that was a question that we we spoke about, and then you you sold it very elegantly, I would say, <laughs> uh, because we have this chorus, and and they are 
they are making this planet coming alive. Yeah. Yeah, musically. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the most beautiful sounds there are. A group of humans singing beautifully together. So, but, and I love that opera choruses especially can be incredibly powerful at the same time. We have them singing softly a lot in this one to create eeriness and to create these misty textures. Um, and they use words every once in a while, but a lot of the time they're present, but you kind of have to lean in to tell whether they really are there, mm -hmm. which is perfect for this, you know, approaching presence that is felt by one person only for the first act, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Royce has written some extraordinary text for the planet to then express to Justine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a fun device. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, now you already started writing a new opera, or maybe that's, that opera is almost perhaps ready. But, uh, and that's also based on a film, actually, mm -hmm. Fanny and Alexander by, by Bergman. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, it, I mean, opera looks very uh, bright uh, in your perspective, I would say. <laughs> but, but, but what can we say? You have already been talking about how you can make an opera for the audience of today and so on. But how do you look at the future of opera? How, how will the audience, how will we make the audience come to, to the old opera houses and so on? Uh, I mean, so there's the big beautiful tradition of it that we want to maintain, kind of like we want to keep our old Hollywood movies around because they're fantastic pieces of art. But I think a degree of irreverence is good, to not be afraid of you know, exploding the art form a little. It's, it's an amazing thing that can be anything, really. Just like modern dance today can be anything on a stage. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know, what do you think? Mm. Yeah, um, I would say that I'm cautiously optimistic. I, I think that um, it, it seems very tenuous in America. Um, it feels like every day I wake up and there's another story of an opera company imploding because um, the, the funding has evaporated and audiences are not yet coming back after COVID and, and there are many, many factors. Uh, in Europe, it seems slightly healthier or, or maybe majorly healthier. Yes, yes, I think <laughs> um, so. With the, with the government <laughs> subsidies. And, uh, and so I think that that's really, like, that's super helpful, obviously. I do think that if we want the next generation to come and see opera, we have to tell stories that engage them. And I don't think that much of the canonical rep is really igniting their imaginations. You can put the most divinely irreverent uh, productions on top of this literature. But my, my brother, for instance, is a farmer. Um, uh, we all we come from a family of farmers. He's an environmental uh, scientist now, but, uh, but lives on the land. And he hasn't seen an opera yet. He's seen a few of mine on video, but has never actually been in a house. And I keep thinking, what would my brother, what would it take for my brother to buy a ticket to the opera? And I could sit there for an hour and tell him why Carmen is a beautiful opera and why the themes resonate with, or should resonate with anyone. And it still wouldn't move him to buy a ticket. But I think that um, a melancholia or um, insert a great Hollywood movie from the last five years that sold a gazillion dollars worth of tickets. And I don't want to suggest that we just need to do the Broadway thing and just cycle through hit movies to, to make opera. But I do think that there needs to be an on-ramp mm. um, for new audiences to feel like we are creating work that they can see themselves in and that truly reflects the experience that they're having in the world. And I, I really think that we are doomed if we expect the 22-year-olds out there to uh, be convinced that Bohem is, is a narrative that is so important to them that they're going to spend $1,500 bringing a family mm. to come see an opera at the Metropolitan yeah. Opera in New York. Mm. Luckily, the, the prices are a bit lower, it's, it's yeah. been, thank but God. But still, <laughs> you know, it, like tickets, how much yeah, are yeah. tickets? Yeah, exactly. It's, and you have to buy a babysitter if you want to come with just your husband. Um, you, so if you want to come in from a, a regional place to come and see, you have to, it's an investment for a, a train ticket. And, yeah maybe a hotel for the night, like it's, it's an investment. And yeah. so I want to respect that. And I want to do work that warrants people 
investing their time and serious financial commitments? Um, I think we have to also stop asking the question as a category that we want people to fall in love with. It's like saying, do you love pop music? No one's going to say yes uh, about all pop music. So it's, it's very simple. We have to create the good pieces. If there's a good piece that people can go and see, I don't think that the fact that it's an opera is going to be the obstacle. It's only about quality and talking not about it in general terms. People don't, we, we're not going to make people fall in love with opera. We're going to make them fall in love with an opera and then they're going to find another one and then they're going to find another one. And we don't talk about it that way, which I think is unfortunate. Because it's, then it becomes a chore that we have to fall in love with opera to save it. And I think that's the, the defeatist perspective. So we just have to make sure that we make really good pieces, which is incredibly hard. And a lot of the pieces out there are not good, but that's just how new music works. So as long as we have some really good pieces that come along every once in a while, those are the ones that we should lean on and just take a chance on. Yeah. But I think as a, as a category, we can't save a category just because the category has to survive. Mm. We create the beautiful pieces and, then, and it will. Yeah. Okay, and we are so much looking forward now to, to your first opera here in, in Stockholm at Royal Swedish Opera. So thank you. Oh my God, thank you. Royce <laughs> and Lucas. Thank, thank you. you.